Hey, we're back here in the Legends Lounge for the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. As always, I'm your host, Dan Egan. Uh, and tonight, like all nights, we have a really special guest. Allison Owen uh, was on top of the world for the U.S. Uh, Nordic team uh, and held a very interesting record. She had the highest finish uh, of any U.S. Nordic skier for 33 years. Uh, she's eight-time U.S. national champion um, and really was the face of uh, Nordic skiing here in the country for a very, very long time. As always, we're going to kick it off with the executive director of the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame, Justin. Justin, how you doing? I'm good, Dan. Doing great. You? Yeah, love it. We're uh, we're back into the skinny st- skis and the endurance athletes, and, and uh, I just love that because I know how hard Nordic skiing is to compete in. I mean, it's exhausting, uh, and they make it look so easy. They make it look easy. Well, talk about technique, right? I mean, to study the technique and, and be able to, you know, they say that you ski your best uh, – Nordic wise, uh, when you're just absolutely 100% cooked, have nothing left because you have nothing else to do besides focus on that perfect technique. Um, and it's funny because, you know, we'll talk with Allison, but you go out and you look for, you know, maybe 10, 15 really good solid strides when you're out on a, on a little 40 minute workout or something. And you ski with somebody that made a career out of it. And it, you can't help but think, man, that's cheating. They're too good. <laughs> good too smooth too uh too mentally tough uh ladies and gentlemen allison owen hello hi allison. how are you guys good welcome to the legends lounge it's lovely to have you congratulations thank you very much it's an honor uh it's really quite something you know i've been thinking about this interview with you uh to win a world cup uh in u.s soil uh that must have been quite something when you did that. Um, and uh, you want to just talk about winning a World Cup uh, at home? Well, first of all, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah, it, it's it's always been with me. And uh, it's kind of go- gone in and out of phases. Uh, where it was kind of accepted as as the World Cup. And then sometimes people said, well, that was pre-modern World Cup. And uh, it is what it, it is, uh, the history of women's skiing and Nordic skiing. But it was an official World Cup that year because there were like eight World Cups. And that was the first one. I ended up that year seventh overall, five Russians, one Norwegian ahead of me. And uh, yeah, it was really great. I mean, I remember going into that race and I'd gone out and warmed up and then I came in and I was changing my socks and I was thinking, you know, I could win this. And I just said, okay, you can, but now you got to go through the process of actually doing that. And it was a, not an easy ski day and and it was a really hard uh race to do because of the conditions but persevered and and it was exciting it was really fun i think for a lot of people not just me but you know nordic skiing was trying to make some headway in results and and uh we did so that was it was really fun really great and yeah, it's it's been a um, marker in my life for sure that um, that day. Uh, just another example of setting the intention and then moving forward. Of course, it's never quite that easy. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say it, it's another to do it, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah. where there's a time during the race where you're like, wow, it's really going to happen. Yes, there were several because we kept getting splits. And so I knew where I was in the race and it, you know, it's, it's sometimes as a racer, some people need to overcome that fear of fear of success in a way. And, uh, and, and just to persevere and, and, uh, okay, I'm leading and then concentrate on skiing and keep your mind in the right place to actually ski another you know, 10 minutes or five minutes uh, and just stay focused on the skiing, not get sidetracked with 
oh my gosh, I'm winning. Oh my gosh, this and that. Because then your focus is this anymore. It's on something else. And so it's a mind game. But um, I loved that part of skiing where it's like meditation. It's, it's you have to stay focused in the moment. As soon as you aren't in the moment of skiing that you're doing, you're not doing your best. And so staying focused on the feeling, like um, you guys were talking about technique, stay super focused on efficiency and speed. And it's, it's fun. It's really fun. Uh, it's great to hear you describe that as an endurance athlete, you know, it's, it's one thing I think, um, you know, hurling yourself down a mountain ski racing to be in the moment, uh, it's all happening so fast, but, uh, as an endurance athlete, it seems sometimes like it may never end. And there's so many ways to, to be d interrupted in the moment. Uh, and one of them is just plain being tired. <laughs> how do you, how do you, how do you overcome that? Training a lot so that you're used to being tired and still focused, um, kind of being okay with that feeling of tired, handling it in a way where you're working on things in your technique and through the terrain that keep the speed, maybe without quite so much energy, um, being really good at carrying speed. Uh, into you know down a hill up half the next one being really efficient so it's really kinesthetic sport especially when you get tired um but that's what i loved about it was was the glide the feeling of how to do the speed yeah does that answer it <laughs> yeah no i mean that's that's fascinating to me you know because you have to sort of refocus on the basics right uh, and and be solid in your technique uh, to overcome uh, as an en endurance athlete. Um, you know, you you had a lot of success, and but but not. What was the team like at that time? Uh, you know, how big a team was it, and how much support were you getting on the national level? And who were some of your teammates? Well, you're talking about during that phase of my career, the, the end, um, because I had, you know, I started uh, being on the national team. I was 16. I was a junior in high school and I raced internationally two world championships and an Olympics. And then I retired and I went to Alaska to school, to college. I raced on the well, Pacific, whatever it is that Keegan and Sadie and all those guys go to now. It used to be Alaska Methodist University when I went there. Now it's APU, I think. But it, it was the same program. And uh, so I was up there for two years because when I raced already those two world championships and an Olympics, I was young. I was 16, 18 at the Olympics. And, and, I wasn't getting any better, really. My results were still in the 30s, and I, I was just discouraged after all that training, those years putting it in. And so I said, you know, I'm going to go to school for a while. And I went to Alaska, and I kept training because I always really liked it. And, uh, <laughs> and I trained hard up there, and my coach said, hey, we're going to the Nationals, which were also the tryouts – for the next world championships. And so I said, yeah, sure. Okay. Cause there weren't really college races for women then. Um, so I went and when I started, I, after those two years in Alaska, I was older. I was now actually a senior a competitor age wise and started really. And I was so focused. I really wanted to maximize my abilities. Koki had won his medal and prove that hey Americans can do this and so I really focused on my training my skiing getting really solid technique and and uh we had some really good uh Rob so the waxing guru at that time and he really got us good skis and our program was good enough by then that 
like our plane tickets, all the little details that you kind of don't think about, but say the plane tickets to Europe, we didn't have long layovers. Uh, so we weren't totally exhausted when they got there. Just just all the tiny details that had to come together to make it work. Uh, we're working. And yeah, so, so the team was small, but I would say efficient and really good and um, really quite excellent. That That's amazing. So sort of uh, coming back a little bit more mature, uh, a little more focus, you started to feel the results. Uh, that must have brought a lot of confidence. Yeah, and it was really fun, um, you know, to go into a race. And I really had fun racing in Europe because in the U.S., you know, it's hard when you're kind of expected to win. Uh, and it's a big deal if you don't. It's not that big of a deal if you do. Uh, so really, it's kind of a hard place to be. But in Europe, wh when I was racing, I really liked it because it was always going forward um, to be, you know, to be there. And not kind of that fear of failure, like, oh, God, I hope I don't get beat today. It's like, it was just really fun to, to, to uh, race over there and, and go into races knowing that I didn't, I could easily, not easily, but realistically be in the top five, top 10, and uh, even have a chance to medal. I remember I got second at Homicolon in the 10K there. And and just to be a force. And one of my coaches said to me, he goes, you have made it in Nordic skiing when you get on the start line and you're a threat to win. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I'm almost there. <laughs> no, I, I, I love that. And and I, I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, because it's so much more popular and, and uh, accepted in, in Europe, Nordic skiing, the crowds, the, the whole culture around it. And then, of course, you mentioned the Oslo uh, event. Uh, to, to land a second at that, that must have been like, people must have gone crazy for that. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you know, that was in the 10K, and a couple of days before that was the 5K, and I was leading, I was winning that, and at, I don't know how it is now there, but they used to have the Norwegian army all around the course, kind of in the temple. There's thousands of people, and and um, an army guy stepped out right in front of me, and I crashed into him. And uh, leading, okay, I ended up seventh in that race. But from that day, I knew that I could do well in the ten. Okay, and um, I was actually, I think, a little better in a five. Okay. I'm I have a lot of speed compared to strength kind of and so uh, you know the tent's a little more challenging for me but it was good and uh, yeah I got second there uh the the army guy would have been an easier way to meet you <laughs> if he had done it slightly differently I imagine <laughs> uh, yeah it was he felt bad knocked the wind out of me and um it, you know it's just a shock and uh yeah, so those things happen. I know that it happened to Martha Rockwell one time. She got knocked over in a race. And yeah, it just it's hard to refocus the, what we were talking about before. It's really hard to get that focus back uh, when you're kind of in shock a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, when you look back at your career and uh, and you think about uh, that in perspective, uh, uh, how would you sort of summarize yourself as a competitor? Well, I'll tell you, after I, after the Lillehammer Olympics, I listened to an interview by the men's team, the Norwegian men's team, and they had done so well there. They'd won so many gold medals. And one of the interviewers asked them, why do you think you did well? Why do you do so well? And they said, because we love it. And I think that is the same for me. I think I did well because I really loved it. And 
And when you come from love, when I come from a love of something, you have a lot of energy and a lot of passion and, and, um, it just comes out and, and the training is easier. I'm not saying I have passion every day to go training, but the overall effect of racing and, and that life, especially for a, a girl in that day, it was huge because I knew there weren't many sports I could do and bring it to that level. When I started, I went to junior nationals and I had to race boys. I made the boys team <laughs> to go to the junior nationals and there, it, there wasn't women's Nordic Olympic teams. Uh, and so I love the fact that I was born at the right time to do this. And I always felt blessed that Herb Thomas opened up that program for us. It just, all the, all the steps and all the doors opened for me to be in that place. And I was always grateful for that because if it would have been a year or two before, you know, or something, I wouldn't have hit that opportunity. And I'm just grateful I did because it really fit my nature and I love it. Uh, born in the right time, born <laughs> for the right things. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, a uh, uh, part of your class induction into the uh, U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame is uh, Kit Delorier, the first in ski on every uh, all the seven summits. Uh, and when she was in the Legends Lounge, she talked about the same thing, uh, moving out of a center of love. And uh, it's so, and I think you'll enjoy uh, talking with her about that because it was a real anchor. So it's really quite interesting to hear you say that. Uh, and it's also quite impressive to see the smile when you say it. Uh, it's so authentic. Uh, I imagine you still get the same joy when you go out there skiing now. I do, but I'll have to tell you that sometimes I'm out there. You know, I'm almost 70. And, and uh, I think, dang. I should have been like a piano player or something because <laughs> you you don't get better with age <laughs> here. And like if you were a musician, maybe you could still be getting better at, you know, through all the aging process. But the joy of it and being out and just moving on snow and, and skiing, all kinds of skiing, um, it, you know, that joy never goes away. But I'll tell you, the physical prowess, you know, it doesn't get better. Uh, well, maybe, but uh, of course, you're still out there doing it, and I'm sure there's plenty of people who cannot keep up. Uh, how much has technique uh, changed and the equipment changed uh, since Lola Hammer to now? Oh, well, huge. Um, you know, I, I can't even say, like, I saw this meme on, or not even a meme, it was just this thing on Facebook. I follow that 60s, 70s, 80s group of Nordic skiing. And they they had this picture of what it the equipment that it took in say the 50s and 60s and 70s to be a top skier. And you know, one one or two pair of skis and and poles and you know pretty basic simple things. Now it's like it doesn't even all fit in a picture all the things that you need. You know, 10 pair of skate skis lots of classic skis all kinds of oh it's just huge what it takes now to to have the type of equipment and um clothing and even hydrating stuff and oh my gosh it's so huge and and it, to me it was simple as a, like in running you know all you need is a pair of shorts and some running shoes and maybe a jacket now and then but he needs to be a lot more simple and even then, we would take these big ski bags to Europe, you know, heavy. Like we'd probably have 10, 12 pairs of skis. We thought that was huge. Today, that's not huge. And and so and also the grooming has improved so much that that skiing is a lot faster now. Uh, and and I think there's things we miss. Uh, with the old type skiing. I think it was it was fun to go out just meandering through the woods on a narrow trail. 
now they're all like freeways and you know the difference between driving a car on a bumpy dirt road and going on the freeway uh you know the freeway's fast but you don't you know you're missing some stuff so i would i would say it's you know there's never all good or all bad but i like the old day skiing uh, it's great to hear you describe that and, and kind of draw that picture. Uh, it's really, really awesome. The, uh, you know, and of course, Nordic skiing, uh, to me, it just always brings me back. You know, it just saw it. it there's something about it uh, to be out there in the woods or across a field uh, that's so peaceful and settling. Uh, and, and I imagine that that's a big part of your fuel for going out there. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of days you'll think, oh, you know, I don't really, really want to go. But but then you remember that Nike ad, just do it and and just get out the door. A lot of times that's the hardest part is getting off the couch and getting outside. And once you are, or once I am anyway, it's like, I always forget how cool this is. And then you get out there and it's like, you're in love with it again. And yeah, I just have to have to keep going. There's there's a uh, joy in it almost any weather, any time you're outside. And so, yeah, it's talking about, you know, the women in skiing. Um, isn't it interesting that the Vobit, which is the oldest ski race uh, and probably the biggest one, uh, they ban women in racing that from 1924 to 1980 huh. and and they said it was because you know they thought that women weren't capable it was, it was too hard for women and and that's you know women are so good at enduring <laughs> um and and you know we train to endure um so I don't know. I just think there's still a lot of misconceptions about what women are capable of. And, you know, I was in the gym the other day and I, I, I do weights and um, and I was doing my squats and this girl comes up, the pull up bars right beside me. And she just cranks out like eight pull ups, like nothing. And I'm like, whoa, that's impressive. And she's not even like an athlete really i ask her what sport do you do and she goes yeah i don't really do a sport it's just gotten so normal for women to just be this way and i i didn't grow up with that at all like we didn't have track in my school in my high school wow. we went to the principal of my high school and we said we want girls track and he goes oh well let's see we need an advisor and and they couldn't find an advisor. So my friend's mom, who's a part-time typing teacher said, oh, I'll be your advisor. And so we started Women's Track just by going in there and saying, we want girls track. And yeah, I mean, we won state meet, a uh, bunch of skiers. Um, but anyway, I think there's still a lot that we need to get over about about being women or men or sort of that and yeah there's huge differences but we can still do it. you know in Voslopic when they didn't allow women women would dress up as men and they would put on a beard and they would put on a mustache and, you know dress up like a guy and do it anyway is this the Vasa down uh northern Michigan Travis no the Vasa in Sweden Oh, in Sweden. Okay. Give us a little bit. Yeah. That's uh, the, that's awesome. And it's a great perspective. I wanted to uh, circle back with you on sort of coming back as a mature athlete, uh, because I, I know that particularly with the U S we throw a lot of younger athletes at, at the more mature Europeans all the time in almost every sport I can think about. Uh, and, uh, if there's someone out there listening, uh, and struggling, maybe, uh, what, what what advice would you give them uh, to hang in there so that they don't sell themselves short for something that would come back as an older athlete? Right. It's very true. Um, I think uh, the, the culture of Nordic in the U.S. is growing and it's getting stronger. And I think it's from experience that we learn those things. And different generations 
you know, you have to go through generations to actually learn it. And, and I was the first of my generation, my, my mom and, and the women before me in the U S anyway, didn't know Nordic skiing. And so I've been a coach now and helped other athletes and share those stories. And I think that's the way to do it is share that story about, you know, I didn't really get good at this sport, really good at it until I was 28. And I got on the national team at 16. Look at Keegan, you know, five Olympics. I mean, it's a long adventure. And, and I think it's a hard adventure because monetarily there's not a lot there when you're finished, you know, slim picking sometimes. So uh, I think that it is, it is happening as a mature person. And I remember when we, when I was 16 at the first world championships, women had been going to the Olympics since 1952. That's a year before I was born. And we went there as the first U.S. women's team. And we kind of expected, oh, well, you know, we should be able to be racing here. Uh-uh. We were way behind culturally. And we were juniors. Can you imagine a U16 girl trying to race in that experience? So I think... The culture's growing is what I'm trying to say. And and as generations keep going, we'll learn that that mature athletes look in basketball now and football, how old some of those guys can be and just be excellent. So I think age is, is not as big of a deal as it used to be. I remember I retired when I was 28 and I was really at the peak of my physical abilities but um, didn't really know that you could probably do this till your, I don't know, 30s, mid 30s at least. It's a great, uh, yeah, great, great perspective. I really do appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> and I know that a lot of young athletes, it's a message they they all really need to hear. Um, you know, you really were a pioneer, uh, had a very successful uh, career. Uh, you're now elected into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Uh, when you look back over your career, I'm wondering what you're most proud of. Well, at race results, I think I'm probably the most proud of that overall year where I ended up seventh with five Russians during the era when doping was legal. Uh, we didn't know anything about it, but five Russians, uh, doping was legal. So you wonder where you really were. Um, so I think that whole year was really great for me. It showed that I'd put the time in and, and really the dedication to be good at that sport. And so that is uh, good for me. I think another thing I'm really proud of is I raised my two children in this sport and I raised them and was coaching in Sun Valley and that was our family way of connecting because uh, Rob Kiesel's their dad and he was involved with Swix. And so skiing, Nordic skiing was the thing that brought our family together and we really all loved. And so I'm proud of that, that, that we built the culture uh, through our family with skiing. And I've just loved the sport in a lot of ways, my own racing, coaching, raising my kids in it. And, helping communities, uh, yeah, through skiing. <laughs> a lot to be proud of, Justin, and uh, yet another one uh, here in the Legends Hall of Fame that has an impact and the foresight to give back to the industry. Yeah. Yeah, it's great having you, Allison, and uh, obviously being rooted in uh, Nordic country here in, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, it's just great to see you. Uh, see an ambassador like yourself go out and, and do so many incredible things. You say good, we say great. Um, you weren't good at the sport. You were great at the sport um, and still probably are. So I wouldn't want to raise you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's fun. You know, you just do your best to have fun at it. Without having fun, 
uh, it's nothing. I remember the last time I saw John Engen, who's now passed, but um, I was in Ketchum and I, I drove to this parking lot and I got out and John says, hey, I haven't seen you for a long time. I said, I know, I just ski for fun now. And he goes, well, why else would anyone ski? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's right. I was meaning I didn't race anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true just ski for fun and go fast well we definitely look forward to uh being able to uh in uh do this in person uh congratulate you in person and have a proper induction in the u.s ski and snowboard hall of fame and thanks for your time allison and thanks for sharing so much with us today oh you're welcome and i want to thank you for honoring excellence i think sometimes it's not done enough. And um, I think excellence, it, it, it's important and, and um, it's a hard thing to do. And so thank you for, for supporting it. Uh, you bet. Thanks so much. And uh, that's what happens here in the Legends Lounge. We have legends at the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame.